Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Deacon Isaac Longworth, and I'm so excited to share with you this huge milestone for this show because this is the 100th episode of Heroes of the Faith. And it's been so amazing to share so many different lives of the saints with you. And I really wanted to pick a saint today who would make this show extra special. This is a saint who is loved by many people. He's very famous and he's quite recent in church history as well. His name is St. Pio of Pietrelcina, otherwise known more famously as St. Padre Pio. Now, his life is amazing and there's so much to cover. So I'm just going to jump right into it and start at the very beginning where little baby boy was born in 1887 in the small Italian town of Pietrelcina. He was born to poor peasant farmers and his parents gave him the name Francesco Forgione which was named after his older brother who had died as a baby. And altogether, the Forgione family had eight children. Now you might be thinking, well, hold on a second. I thought his name was Pio. Why, why is he called Francesco? Don't worry. We'll get to that. We'll get to that in a second. Well, Francesco, when he was 10 years old, met a Capuchin friar who was begging in the neighborhood. Capuchin friars, they were a kind of Franciscan. Uh, They lived off of charity, priests and brothers living together, founded by St. Francis of Assisi. And as a little 10-year-old, Francesco was really taken by this friar. He loved his kindness, he loved his joy, but he especially loved his huge black beard. All of the Capuchins had big beards, they never shaved, and little Francesco was like, hey, that looks pretty cool. And he went home to his parents and told them, I want to be a Capuchin. I want to have a beard like him when I grow up. Now, of course, this very early calling to become a Franciscan didn't start off maybe the most mature way it could, but as he grew into a teenager, he was actually planning on going through with it, not just because of the beard, but because he felt that God was really calling him into this. And so he was planning on entering the novitiate, which is the beginning stages for becoming a Capuchin priest. But right before he entered, he ran into two major obstacles. The first one is that uh, an anonymous letter was mailed to the priest who was in charge of accepting new applicants. And this anonymous letter accused Francesco of having an impure relationship with a woman. And so this meant that his whole application was paused and he wasn't allowed to be an altar server anymore until this whole situation was cleared up. Now, obviously, Francesco knew that he had not done what he had been accused of, and yet he humbly and obediently submitted to the investigation until eventually his name was cleared when the priest found out that the letter was a fake sent in by old classmates who had a grudge against Francesco. Now, Francesco generously decided to pray for the conversion of these guys who had tried to lie about him. But he did admit that his prayer wasn't perfect because he said, At times I mentioned to God, My Lord, if it is necessary to give them a whipping or two in order to convert them, please do it, as long as their souls are saved in the end. So even though his forgiveness wasn't perfect right off the bat, he still wasn't opposed to them getting beaten for what they had done. He still wanted them to be saved in the end. He still wanted to forgive them. Now, the second obstacle to him joining the novitiate came about from Francesco himself because he was really sad about leaving his family behind. He was really homesick. And in response to this sadness, the Lord inspired his imagination one day while he was praying. And in his imagination, he saw these evil dark figures and glowing bright figures in kind of this arena symbolizing demons and the angels. And then there was this weak soul in the middle who symbolized Francesco and one of the evil figures tried to defeat Francesco until a strong man full of light who represented Jesus came to his help and together they triumphed over evil. And Jesus said to Francesco that the devil will continually renew his assault, but don't fear. Remember What I have promised you, that I will always be close at hand and I will always help you in conquering him. And so Francesco was encouraged by this, encouraged that the Lord would be with him. 
And so Francesco was able to muster up the courage to leave his family behind and join the Capuchins when he was only 15 years old. And one of the rules of joining the Capuchins is that you took on a new name to symbolize your new life. And so he took on his new name, Brother Pio. Now, the life of the Capuchins was not easy. It was one of poverty, of prayer, of strict obedience to his superiors. Brother Pio slept on a bed made out of corn husks every night. He had to do a lot of chores. He had to wake up in the middle of the night to go and pray at certain hours. It was very difficult. But by far the most challenging part of being a novice, of being a new Capuchin, was obedience to the novice master. Because the novice master was not a kind man, to put it lightly. He liked to exercise his power in a controlling and even cruel way over the novices. And so some examples of this that Brother Pio had to put up with is that if any of the novices broke any of the rules, the novice master would shame them by forcing them to eat their food off the ground. He would blindfold them. He would even force them to beat themselves in order to show that he had power over them. Before any of them could even eat, they had to kneel down and ask for his blessing. And if he didn't give it to them, either because he didn't like them or because he just wasn't feeling up to it that day, they had to stay kneeling for the whole dinner until he allowed them to get up off their knees. When their families came to visit them, which was almost never, he forced all of the novices to appear cold and distant from their parents. And he did that to try to force them to show their resolve in becoming priests by even ignoring their own family. Now, understandably, most of the novices buckled under this power-obsessed priest. And they just said, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm going home. But Pio persevered through the harshness because he knew that the call he felt to become a Capuchin didn't come from this priest. It came from Jesus. And so no matter what cruelties the novice master threw at him, Pio wasn't shaken. He was obedient to all of it and he submitted to it for the sake of following the Lord's call. And he even managed to be joyful and even happy in the life that he was living in. He tried to lift the spirits of the other novices around him by encouraging them, by joking with them, and even sometimes by pulling pranks on them. There was this one time where Pio saw that one of his brother novices was coming back from the bathroom, and so he decided to scare him. And so he he grabbed a sheet and pretended to be a ghost, and the novice was so terrified that he started running away and screaming. And Pio didn't want the novice master to wake up and get him in trouble. And so he ran after him, which actually just made the whole situation worse because then the novice thought he was being chased by this ghost. And eventually Pio was able to catch up to him and say, no, no, it's just me. It's just me. Stop screaming. And then quickly the two of them were able to get back into bed before the source of the commotion was discovered. So Pio definitely had a joking side to him and he was able to help some of his brothers get through those tough early years. Now, in the years that followed, as he studied for the priesthood, he became very sick with seemingly undiagnosable symptoms. He would have horrible migraines and fainting spells. He had intestinal problems, which meant that he couldn't keep solid food down. And for six months, he basically survived off of drinking only milk. So very unhealthy, was constantly throwing up. And yet, despite all of these struggles, he stayed true and he persevered to what God was calling him to do. And he became ordained a priest when he was 23. And now instead of Brother Pio, he was Father Pio, or in Italian Padre Pio, which is where that name that he is so famously known for now comes from. Now Padre Pio's health was still really bad. And so after he had a few asthma attacks, it was decided that he wasn't strong enough to live in a monastery with the other Franciscans because that life was just too strict. And it wasn't good for his health. And so he was allowed to keep wearing his capuchin habit, but work as a normal parish priest. And in addition to all of his physical struggles, which were honestly already bad enough, the devil, 
who Padre Pio had envisioned years ago before joining seminary, if you remember that imaginative vision he had, the devil continued to attack the young priest to try to shake him off course, to try and take him out early in his priesthood. So Padre Pio had to go through a lot of really intense, lustful temptations that he just couldn't seem to shake off. And it got so bad that he was talking about it with one of his longtime friends. And his friend, which is a horrible, horrible idea, this friend was not a good friend at all. He suggested to Padre Pio, well, maybe you're just, you know, sexually frustrated and you should just break your vows to chastity once or twice just to clear your mind. Which is terrible, terrible advice to give to a new young priest. And yet that's what his friend said. And Padre Pio was so enraged at this that he grabbed a pitchfork because they were talking in a barn. They were having a conversation there. He grabbed this pitchfork off the wall and chased his friend out of the barn and just put an end to that temptation once and for all. Well, when the devil realized that he wasn't able to get Padre Pio through lust, he decided to try to tempt him through despair and fear. And so Padre Pio became convinced because of the devil's temptations that he had done sins that he couldn't remember. And he was worried that these sins, which he couldn't remember, which probably never happened, were so bad that they were going to bring about punishment from God. And so Padre Pio began to despair of ever going to heaven. He, when he did the smallest sin, he thought to himself, that's it. I'm going to hell. I'm done. I'm doomed. And a wise priest met with him and was able to kind of talk him off the cliff and remind him to overcome this, reminding him Jesus is a merciful God. He's a God who comes to take away sins. He's not a cruel taskmaster that you imagine him to be. Maybe Padre Pio's image of God was shaped by that cruel novice master that he had when he was a novice, that it was impacting his relationship with Jesus. And so he was able to overcome this and move on in hope and love, trusting in the Lord's mercy. Now, frustrated that none of his temptations were working, the devil resorted to physically attacking Padre Pio. That's right. The devil would literally attack him. He would go into his room and destroy everything. He would throw all of his stuff around. Uh, he would even physically beat Padre Pio. Padre Pio described this in his own writings when he said, I cannot describe to you how these wretched creatures, talking about the demons, how these wretched creatures beat me. Sometimes I feel as if I were near death. Now, sometimes while he was being assaulted by these demons and they were tearing up his room and bruising him and beating him up, his guardian angel would appear and would defend him and chase the demons away. And so there was all these mystical, supernatural things going on, all of this spiritual warfare that Padre Pio was going through. But he wasn't just going through spiritual warfare. No, no, he was also going through physical warfare as well because World War I was breaking out in Europe and Italy had no exceptions for priests when drafting men for service into the army. And so Padre Pio was summoned away from his church to serve in the Italian military. Now, due to his bad health, he never actually served in active duty, but he did work as a janitor for the military until his health got so bad that they eventually realized this is a terrible idea and they just discharged him to go home altogether. And upon returning home, his people began to realize more and more they weren't dealing with just any old ordinary priest. There was something different about Padre Pio. When he was saying mass, he would often have such an overpowering sense of the love of God that he would literally lose awareness of his surroundings and he would have to pause the mass. So for instance, he would see souls in purgatory and he would feel compelled to pray for them that they would go to heaven soon. Or he would see Jesus or the angels and he would start to talk with them. He would see the glory of heaven and he would just be staring off into the distance, receiving all of the beauty. And the problem with this is that he kept pausing the mass because he was having all of these visions and ecstasies and a mass that would normally take half an hour. Suddenly it was getting close to two hours with Padre Pio, which is all fine and good for Padre Pio, but the people had places to go to. 
they were getting mad. They were missing their appointments. They were being late for work. And so his superior had to step in and say, look, Pio, I get that you're super holy and you're having all these visions, but you need to reel it in somehow for the sake of the people. And Padre Pio, again, in his obedience, in his humility, he obeyed with great difficulty. But these ecstatic prayer experiences continued and they grew stronger and stronger in intensity, even to the point where Padre Pio received the stigmata, which is a miraculous thing where the wounds that Jesus suffered on the cross are imprinted on a saint. And so Padre Pio explained what happened when this took place. He said, the wounded Christ appeared to me. He did not say anything to me. And he disappeared. And when I came to, because he had basically passed out from the power of this experience, he said, when I came to, I found myself on the floor wounded. My hands, my feet and side were bleeding and they were so painful that I couldn't get up. Padre Pio had been marked by the wounds that Jesus had suffered for him on the cross. Now, because of his humility, Padre Pio didn't want people to think that he was holy. He didn't want people to know about this. And so he tried his best to hide the wounds. He had all these different tricks. He would pull down his sleeves. He would wrap his hands with a handkerchief. He would try to mop up the blood so that people wouldn't see it. But people started to see it. And it wasn't helpful to Father Pio that the wounds were also giving off this beautiful smell like flowers that people could smell as soon as he walked in the room. And they knew that he wasn't wearing perfume. They knew that something else was going on. And so eventually people found out and the word of his holiness spread. Now doctors were called to dress these wounds and to verify that he wasn't harming himself and that no one else had done this to him. And this is what one of the witnesses describes when he described these doctors treating Padre Pio's wounds. He said, a doctor dressed both hands in bandages and put a seal on them and kept them this way for eight days. The doctors medicated them and then sealed them again. And they said that if it was a natural phenomenon, then within eight days, it would have healed. Instead, after eight days, so much blood came out that Padre Pio couldn't even celebrate mass. Now, some priests were really jealous of him. They were jealous of his ecstasies. They were jealous of his stigmata. Some of them even thought that he was a fraud, that he was making it all up. And these rumors even led to his superiors for a time forbidding Padre Pio from acting publicly as a priest. That meant he couldn't say public masses. He couldn't minister as a priest. And despite all of the injustice, Padre Pio just humbly obeyed. He submitted to their decisions, and he trusted that God would clear his name when the time was right. And eventually this did happen. Padre Pio was exonerated of all this, his superiors believed him, and he was able to enter back into ministry to the joy of his people who had missed the fact that their priest was gone. And huge crowds of people came from all over to see him. And it got a little bit crazy, actually. Some people started stealing his laundry and cutting it up for relics. And they were even trying to cut the clothing from his back as he walked. They were tearing strips of clothing off of him because they wanted to hold on to something that belonged to him. And Padre Pio hated this. He hated the attention. And he ordered them over and over again to stop. But sometimes they just wouldn't listen to him. This one time, a woman from the crowd grabbed his arm and she wouldn't let go. And in desperation, he just pleaded with her, all right, you can take my arm, you can have it, but just leave me alone. Another time, religious sisters, nuns asked him for a relic of his clothing. And he told them, sisters, go back to your convent and make your own relics. He was just so upfront with them. He hated the attention. He just wanted to serve the Lord. He wanted people to focus on God, not on him. But people also came to him because he had such an amazing gift for hearing confessions. And one of his gifts was that he had the ability to read souls, which is a kind of prophecy where God would give him information about the sins of the other person in order to help that person make a good confession. 
So this one time this happened where this woman came into the confessional to go to confession and she shared all of her sins. And then she wanted Padre Pio to give her absolution, to give her God's forgiveness. And he told her, I think you've forgotten something. Why don't you go for a walk? And when you come back, you can tell me the sin that you've forgotten. So she went out for a walk and she came back. And when he asked her again, she still refused to tell a sin that she was hiding. And that was the sin that she had had a secret abortion that no one else but her mother knew about. And when he asked her, have you remembered what the sin was? And she said, no, he shocked her by telling her, well, it's because it's the sin of abortion that you haven't told anyone. And she was amazed that he knew. And he showed her that because he said, God knows, God knows what's in your heart. And he helped her to confess that sin and then experience God's mercy and true forgiveness in her life. And while Padre Pio was a very loving and merciful priest in confession, he was also very popular because he could be pretty tough too. He showed people tough love that seemed almost harsh at times. For instance, if Padre Pio had a woman who was immodestly dressed come into his confessional, he wouldn't even hear her confession. He would just send her out and tell her to come back when she was dressed more appropriately. This other time, a blind man came to him in confession and asked for healing for his eyes because Padre Pio would pray with people and they would be healed as well. And Padre Pio not only refused to pray with him for healing, but he even refused to hear his confession. And he called the man a filthy person and told him to get out. Now, of course, this man was offended and he went to a priest and complained about how he had been treated. And when the priest asked him, well, what's going on in your life? Well, the man said that he was living with this woman who he wasn't married with and that he had tried to excuse himself from his sin because he said, well, you know, I'm still young. I kind of need to get this out of my system and it doesn't really matter yet. I'll get married later, maybe. Well, that was why Padre Pio had exhorted him. That's why he had called him a filthy person. And yes, the man had left furious and swearing, but he went home and thought, about what Padre Pio had said, and he realized that he was right. He was convicted by the Holy Spirit of his sin, and he came back and he repented of his sin, and he ended up marrying that woman and leaving the life of impurity that he had been living in. Now, Padre Pio did so many amazing things in the confessional. He even used the miraculous gift of tongues in his confessional. He had this miraculous ability to be able to communicate with people who didn't even speak Italian. He would speak Italian to them and they would speak back to him in French or English or German. And both of them would be able to understand each other miraculously. Padre Pio would also use the gift of tongues, not as a way to communicate in a language he didn't know, but as a way of praying directly to God in a tongue that was of no human origin. Someone described overhearing him doing this one day and wrote down what it was like. He said, slowly in guttural tones, Padre Pio recited a rhythmic prayer, a mystical formula in an oriental language that was unknown to me. I remember the words which recurred continually, Adayanandananda, and this unusual and mysterious invocation aroused my curiosity. Now, if you've never heard people praying in tongues before, you might feel like this guy watching Padre Pio. He's not entirely sure what Padre Pio is doing. And all he can say is he's praying in this rhythmic way, in this mystical way, in an Eastern sounding language that I don't know. He's kind of saying words that sound like Adayanandananda. I don't know what's going on, but it aroused my curiosity. And that's exactly what Padre Pio was doing. He was praying in tongues. He was praying in a language that is not of any human origin, but praying in a heavenly language to God directly. This is described all throughout scripture. And many Christians today pray in tongues just like Padre Pio did. Now, the tough love that Padre Pio showed in the confessional mixed with all of these supernatural gifts worked on the hearts of people. And the lines were so long for his confessional that he needed security guards and an entire ticketing system 
in order to manage the crowds. He heard confessions for hours and hours and hours. And there was certainly a great need in the world to be free from sin because the horrors of World War II began to break out. Padre Pio lived through two world wars and Padre Pio, he lamented that his country had joined the side of Hitler in the Axis alliance. He once said to a friend, do you know what I would do with Hitler if I could get my hands on him? I would put him in a cage and take that cage everywhere so that Hitler would be able to know what people are saying about him. When Mussolini, who had partnered with Hitler, sent messengers asking Padre Pio to pray for the Italian war efforts, Padre Pio responded, So you come to me after you have destroyed Italy? You can tell Mussolini that nothing can save Italy now. He hated the war, he hated the violence, and all of the evil that was coming upon Italy and upon the world through these forces. Now, eventually, as Padre Pio got older, his health just got worse and worse until he could barely breathe. He was constantly coughing. He was basically drowning from a clogged throat, and he couldn't eat anything. He was confined to a wheelchair at the very end, but he said Mass daily as long as he still had the strength to do so. But he longed to go to heaven. He was tired of living on earth. He wanted to go home to God, and he kept asking his superior, for the permission to die, because he wanted to be obedient to the very end. And eventually he did die, and he went to the Lord who he loved so much. Now it's no wonder that Padre Pio is a saint who has captured the hearts of millions of people. His life is truly incredible, not only because of all the astounding miracles that he was able to work, the stigmata, the tongues, the prophecy, but I think it's more miraculous that his humble obedience was so evident in his life, that he was obedient even when his superiors were unreasonable, when they were jealous, even when they were cruel. That's a real miracle. That's the true mark of a saint. And so let's pray right now that we would become saints just like Saint Padre Pio. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Padre Pio, you were faithful to the Lord's call even when authorities in the church treated you unfairly, even when people lied about you. You trusted that God would vindicate you, and in the end, he always did. So help us to imitate you in being obedient to the authorities that God has given us in our lives, relying on the Lord to give us the strength to surrender our own wishes, our own will, just like you did. You were an amazing confessor, Padre Pio, help those of us who are Catholic to never lose our love for the sacrament, to go to confession often, to receive both the mercy and the tough love of the Lord through the words of the priest. St. Pio of Pietrelcina, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.